Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Concordia Strategic Dialogue. My name is Peter Sands. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. And I want to, first of all, welcome all our great speakers today. First of all, special thanks to Her Excellency Monica Gengos, First Lady of the Republic of Namibia. Thank you so much for being here today, Your Excellency. I'd also be delighted to welcome Mike Froman, Vice Chairman and President, Strategic Growth at MasterCard, Peter Lee, Corporate Vice President, Microsoft Healthcare, Jennifer Lotito, President and CEO of Red, Peter Michelari, Deputy CEO, ABSA Group Limited, and Carlos Sambi, Secretary General, World YMCA. As we all know, COVID-19 is not just a public health crisis, but an economic one too. But simply trying to mitigate the consequences for businesses and the economy won't work. If we don't deal with the root cause, the virus itself, the collateral damage to lives, livelihoods, businesses and economies will continue to escalate. Some of the numbers are very striking already. The IMF estimates that on average COVID-19 and the associated containment measures, lockdowns have cost Africa over 65 billion a month. And indeed the IMF now expects economic activity in sub-Saharan Africa to contract by 3.2% this year. As, that, as if that wasn't enough, the battle against COVID-19 cannot be seen in isolation. If we don't help the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries and communities fight COVID-19 now, then other deadly diseases, and given my role, I'm focused on HIV, TB, and malaria, will come raging back. We run the risk with malaria, HIV, and TB of giving up the gains that we have made over the last decade or so. Modeling from UNAID in WHO suggests that you could see a doubling of deaths from these, the three biggest infectious disease killers pre-COVID, if we don't act decisively. Now, actually, I think we might have averted the worst case scenario in terms of that knock-on impact through the urgent action of institutions like the Global Fund and our many partners, and really fantastic initiatives and creativity in the countries by governments, by civil society, by communities themselves. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. The level of disruption to other parts of the health service has been very significant. In the 100 plus countries the Global Fund supports, 75% have seen significant disruptions to service delivery. So we've seen life-saving treatment of people living with HIV disrupted or interrupted. We've seen testing and case finding for TB disrupted Interrupted. We've seen prevention activities across all three diseases cancelled or delayed. This pandemic requires of all of us an extraordinary level of collective leadership. We need leadership that shows people a way forward, that deploys resources smartly and swiftly, and that encourages innovation so that we find ways around the new problems that COVID is presenting. And we need leaders that can work together, that can unite to fight the challenge. We also need significantly more money. The Global Fund, for example, has called for another $5 billion over the next 12 months to continue to fight COVID-19, to protect health workers, to reinforce systems for health, and defend progress against HIV, TB, and malaria in the countries where we invest. Now, so far, only a fraction of this funding has been received. And it's not just for the Global Fund. The broader need has so far not succeeded in raising nearly as much as 
required. We actually see in the Global Fund that our emergency response mechanism, what we call the COVID-19 response mechanism, um, will effectively run out of money by the middle of October. G20 governments, OECD governments have themselves deployed extraordinary levels of money in response to the crisis. Uh, the total is well over 10 trillion at this point. But that 10 trillion has largely been on responding to the domestic socioeconomic consequences of the crisis rather than on the tools we need to fight the virus or on supporting low and middle income countries as they respond to COVID. Just 1% of that trend trillion that has been spent on OECD response programs would massively accelerate the development of new tools, vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, and could transform the fight against COVID-19 in the poorest and most vulnerable countries and save millions of lives. Indeed, just imagine what even 1% of what it has cost the private sector so far was spent on accelerating the development of new tools and supporting low and middle income countries in their responses. And the reality is without putting more money into these responses, we run the risk of really significant health, social, economic disruption, which in some of the more vulnerable countries in the world could lead to a very, very dire and difficult situation. I think the private sector has both a massive amount at stake here and a massive amount to offer. Many of the partners that are on this call are examples of institutions with fantastic capabilities in data, in technology, in information, in finance, um, that can bring to bear those capabilities swiftly and effectively to help countries respond to this extraordinary challenge. We know all too well as the Global Fund, the power of the private sector in terms of innovation, creativity, reach, to change the way we fight infectious disease. We need to harness all of that in the fight against COVID-19. And we also need the advocacy because of what's at stake for the private sector. Uh, I talked about the Global Fund 5 billion. That's just a subset of what the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator has put forward as an ask, which is of $35 billion across vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, and PPE. The reality is that if we brought forward resumption of normal economic activity in the world by one week, that number would be paid for several times over. The return on investment on developing and deploying more effective tools to fight this pathogen uh, is extraordinary. COVID-19 is a massive challenge for all of us and the stakes are incredibly high. And certainly as someone who's focused not just on COVID-19, but on the other diseases, it's incredibly important that we don't just look at the uh, success as mitigating the number of people dying who are diagnosed positive with COVID-19. We need to look at success more in terms of the total impact. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and I'm really interested to get your perspectives on how we work together more effectively how we ensure that we defeat COVID-19, but also protect and sustain the progress we've been making on health and social development. How we get 
the scale and speed we require to make this happen. I'd like to start, if I may, with Your Excellency, First Lady of Namibia, Monica Gingos. We've seen governments and the private sector commit immense resources to mitigating the impact of the epidemic, particularly in the high income countries. But when you look at the lower and middle income countries, the pressures on the infrastructure, the systems are almost overwhelming. But we aren't going to solve COVID-19 by simply solving it in the rich countries. We have to solve it everywhere. So we need an extraordinary collective effort, a uh, call to action that draws on resources across both public and private sectors. How, what should that ask look like? And how do we make it a reality? I think if you, I see there's at least three Peters on this call. Um, so if you don't mind calling me Monica, uh, I, I, I always feel uncomfortable when people call me your excellency. But I think um, listening to you, Peter, um, I'm not hearing you say anything different from what you've always been saying when it comes to the strengthening um, of public health. And I think all what COVID does is really make the issues more urgent um, and show how interconnected, not only we as individuals are, but also the issues that, that, that impact us. Um, and I think the reality that COVID does significantly threaten a reversal of uh, substantial gains in the fight against HIV, malaria, um, and TB. And I know that Namibia is a country that has a lot to celebrate in terms of um, these types of gains. And we would never have been able to do it without organizations like yours, Peter, like the Global Fund, like PEPFAR, like um, UNAIDS. Um, and if I look at our malaria response, for instance, um, Global Fund away from government, is Namibia's main funder, um, which takes me to the first point is perhaps in high income countries, it's true that the private sector has played a meaningful role in the strengthening of um, health systems. I'm not so sure how true that is in other jurisdictions, because certainly from a Namibian perspective, I know that the private sector has contributed probably less than 1% when it comes to the HIV response. I'm not sure what the numbers are for uh, malaria and uh, tuberculosis. Um, so certainly much more private sector um, involvement. Um, certainly, and most of the key things I think you've spoken about it, certainly more, um, so more domestic mobilization. And within that more uh, private sector involvement, certainly more collaboration within the private sector. Um, I see Peter Matlari is on the call um, and I've, I've, I was in the financial sector for a long time, but the financial sector is notorious for a little bit working in silos when it comes to CSI and, and uh, corporate responsibility issues. So I think more collaboration from private sector when it comes to, um, to, the, to, to the utilization of funds within the public sector. Um, and COVID doesn't allow us to think anymore that the public health is government's problem. It's, it's all of our problem. And that penny hopefully has dropped by now. Um, but it's also closer collaboration within agencies, whether it's global funds, whether it's UNAIDS, whether it's PEPFAR, but global agencies also working closer together. And even governmental uh, agencies also working closer together. And whatever frustrates us, um, whether it was poor procurement per, uh, processes, whether it was corruption, whether it was incompetence, all of that becomes glaringly obvious because we can see where the imperatives are. Um, I can speak from the perspective of Namibia where we've come through a climate uh, change induced drought um, right after that we were hit by a two, three year recession. And while we were in that recession, we were hit by COVID. Um, that's not a great environment for a politician to be in because it does engender a um, reaction from the population and they are more impatient um, with what they regard as excess and unnecessary spending priorities. And there is an expectation that there is a bigger focus on how um, public funds are utilized. Um, and I say that in cognizance with sometimes the reticence you see from the private sector to assist um, in the public um, health sector. 
Um, I think also the issues around COVID that to me highlight is we, and again, I can't speak for all jurisdictions. I can speak for what I know. It's, um, it's, it's highlighted very problematic um, alcohol consumption tendencies within our populations. And private sector obviously isn't helpful because they are the alcohol distributors and, and, um, and producers, but we, we need to have more frank conversations around issues of mental health, around um, alcohol consumption and problematic social behavior. Um, I sat in on a presentation yesterday, Peter, which really summarizes what I wanted to say today. And that's really got to do with, um, there's about five things. Um, and I know that the International Council on Mining and Metals is working on it and I'm, I'm stealing a few of their concepts, but I think they're important. So I, I really wanna just conclude with those five things. Some of them I've added and changed. Um, and the first from that International Council on Mining and Metals is aligning our short-term response with long-term resilience. The second is developing a mindset for transformation, and that's both within the public and the private sector. Number three is uh, focusing on system level impact. Number four is communication, coordination, and collaboration across the board. And then the fifth point is ensuring leadership inclusivity and bottom-up participation. I think that's really the key um, of what has to happen here. How do we package that? How does that call of action sound different to other calls of action that have been calling for closer private and public sector collaboration? Um, I think the evidence is in front of us. And I think Peter, um, as a man who spent a lot of your life and your, your organizational focus on, on saving millions of lives across the world, I think you must be as horrified um, as we are when we see the possibility of these reversal of gains. And I think we all at the table now and we just need to, as you said earlier, we need to work, leaders need to work together. We need to collaborate. We all understand what the issue is. Um, so I think our space for excuses and politicking and, and um, silos um, has been narrow. Monica, that's brilliant. Um, I think you've thrown quite a challenge out to the private sector participants um, in this um, discussion, but you've also um, reinforced the sense of what's at stake and what we need to do. I, I thought it was funny you used the expression about the, the penny dropping. I mean, the extraordinary thing is COVID is quite some penny, and if it takes COVID for us to realize quite important how important public health is, then somehow or other we've been a bit blinkered um, as societies if, it, if it's really taken that. And isn't that the point, Peter? We have been blinkered because pandemics are reoccurring. We've learned lessons from HIV. We've learned lessons from Ebola, from TB, from malaria. Many of these lessons are the same lessons we're learning now in COVID and we haven't learned the lesson. I think if COVID is not going to teach us to listen and to act, I don't know what will. I think that's exactly right. It's exactly right. And I do think um, the private sector is in different companies, different institutions are in very different places in terms of how much they've gone down the curve of realizing how important these issues are. Mike, Mike Froman, um, can I turn to you on that issue um, actually specifically? Um, just before I joined the Global Fund, I did a bit of analysis with some colleagues actually um, that looked at Fortune 500 companies and said, how many of them had a climate change or environmental strategies? And how many of them had any kind of global health strategy? And, and this was 2017, 74% had a global environmental climate change strategy, 9% um, had a global health strategy, and most of those were pharmaceutical um, uh, companies. And basically, health just wasn't on the agenda of many private companies. Now, MasterCard, very strong partner of the Global Fund and indeed of Gavi as well, clearly got it, clearly realized this well before um, COVID. But how, how do we get these issues um, up the private sector um, agenda. What, what can both, in a sense, converted companies like institutions 
like MasterCard do? What what should the Global Fund and others be doing? To, I mean, if the penny hasn't dropped that businesses depend on good global public health, then I, I don't know what it would take. But how, how do we get them positively engaged? Well, first of all, Peter, thank you very much for, for having me here. And I agreed completely with your, your introductory uh, remarks. Um, as you said, we've been involved in, uh, it, you know, not, not, we're not a public health company. We're not a pharmaceutical company. We're not a manufacturing company that makes PPE or can make respirators or, or things of that sort. But quite early on in this crisis, uh, we came to the realization that uh, it was very much in our interest that there be treatments and diagnostics and a vaccine as quickly as possible and distributed on as equitably a basis as possible um, for not just humanitarian purposes, but for business purposes. It, it, this is a global health crisis, but it's also a global economic crisis. And uh, we came to the conclusion that the, 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 the best thing we could do was to help expedite the discovery and development of treatments for COVID. And that's why we partnered with the Gates Foundation and with Welcome to launch the COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator, uh, which now is mobilized uh, uh, several million, hundred million dollars from many different philanthropists and, and governments to try and do, uh, try and do just that. And, um, but I would say that so hopefully this crisis, unfortunately, sometimes you do need to wait for a crisis to really ring the bell uh, that should have been obvious to everybody. This has certainly underscored that each of our physical and economic well-being is very much tied to everybody else's in the world. And that therefore, we, every company needs to find ways of making a contribution here. I will say the following, though, um, and I, I know I'm preaching to the converted because by definition, the Global Fund is one of the, the leading uh, institutions in the world that does get it in terms of the role of the private sector. Um, but the global fund is rare. And uh, the private sector needs to get their head around how to play a role in this area, how to partner with governments in a more constructive way, how to understand the, the, the normative priorities of governments. Uh, governments have a particular role to play that they can only play. But governments and nonprofits also need to get the private sector a little bit better and be more trustful, more open-minded, not just as a funder, but as an operational partner. Um, as you mentioned, we're working with Gavi to provide our technology, you know, the chip on a card or in a phone to help them deliver vaccines and keep track of, of electronic medical records uh, for vaccinated children. We're partnering with you, the Global Fund and, and Microsoft in Rwanda to help develop a data framework and data security framework. And it's not just about writing a check, but it's bringing our expertise and our products and services and technology to the table. And, but again, Gavi and the Global Fund are rare partners who welcome private sector participation. And I think our cooperation is so important, not just in its own right, but as a for having a demonstration effect to other institutions, ministries of health, governments around the world, other international institutions, so that people could say, okay, we can have the private sector come in within certain constraints, within certain parameters, but because they can really help us solve this problem. My sense is, Peter, that over the last couple of years, there's been a, you know, a lot of debate among CEOs and, and in boardrooms about the role of the corporation in society and a much greater openness towards wanting to have a positive social impact, um, including potentially in areas like global health. But it's hard to do. We've been at it for a decade. We're not new to this. We started with financial inclusion and it expanded, but there are a lot of companies that are trying to figure out how to do it. And I think if we can partner with them as we are, and as others who are successful working with institutions like the Global Fund can partner with others and bring others in, um, I think it can help build more of a, a more momentum within the private sector uh, for this. And that's why we're so excited to be part of this and to be uh, to be a partner of yours. Thanks, Mike. And I have to say, I think the speed with which MasterCard moved on the Therapeutics Accelerator was enormously impressive. At the time, and this was February, uh, I was uh, calling up my old contacts as 
in the financial world and um, trying to get them interested. And it was very, very difficult to get people to focus on um, why we needed money fast to develop new therapeutics for COVID. But the case is extraordinary. I mean, one of the things that would make stock markets be in much better shape, make people feel safe to go to their jobs, is if we had a treatment that halved the mortality. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing we get by that. Um, your other point I'd highlight is the, um, uh, it's a two-way thing. We need both businesses to come and we need the global health community to welcome and engage with businesses in a way that understands both what businesses can offer, but also the constraints. Um, and one of the surprises to me coming from the private sector was how much mistrust of the um, private sector there is in the global health community. Peter Meshlari, um, can I turn to you now? Um, ABSA is a, a new partner for the Global Fund. We're delighted to be in partnership um, uh, with you. Can you talk a bit about ABSA's perspective on um, the impact on COVID, what, what, you know, why you're engaging um, in partnership and, and, and also more generally how you think the financial sector can contribute in a more joined up global response. Thank you, thank you, Peter, and good morning, afternoon to everybody. You know, Peter, as I was listening to you, it kind of took me back a number of years to when the HIV pandemic really hit this part of the world. And I remember having the good fortune of working with former president Mandela, Bono, and a range of people across societies across the world in trying to galvanize people into understanding just the impact of that, of that pandemic. So from the private sector, uh, you had a range of foundations, et cetera, and indeed, ultimately, the financial services community as well. So when I look at how we've responded this time, I think that history has in part informed APSA's response anyway. We had to be more agile and you've been a banker for a very long time, you know how bureaucratic we can be. But in terms of how we had to deal with A, our own colleagues, so safety for colleagues at work, safety for customers, because there was a lot of misinformation about what could and what couldn't happen. And that's not just in the South African context, but across all of the markets where we are, the 12 markets across the continent. So we had to very quickly get the institutional infrastructure up and running and fund it. And you know, notoriously, when you've got to go and find new budget, generally people say, sorry, come next, next season or next year. This time that money was actually galvanized very quickly because there was an acute understanding in part informed by the HIV pandemic that we went through many years ago, but also in part uh, informed by the Ebola crisis that we'd seen across the continent. So in part, there was some learning that we had. We also understood very quickly that the public health infrastructure that we have, and you know, South Africa in some ways is a little more privileged. So when I look across some of our other markets, you know, you move out of Nairobi into some of the rural areas in Kenya, you're not going to find field hospitals that can very easily deal with an outbreak. And so how do you find the right partners that we can work with in order to roll out some of that, that infrastructure? Remembering that as a bank, uh, in some ways you can facilitate, you can put some cash in, but you're never going to fund it in totality. So we had to learn very quickly to kind of find pillar partners. Obviously the Global Fund is one of those pillar advocacy partners that's got depth and breadth in the area, hence our partnership. But beyond yourselves, we also got into feeding schemes. It might sound rather strange, but we found that it was immediately important to feed people, those who may be migrant laborers, they may, live on the streets, they, anyway, I can go on and on, but so we had to put out infrastructure and work with reputable organizations that could feed people daily. At some point, we passed the three million meal marker a, a number of weeks ago, knowing that was still not enough. And, and the other element, of course, which one always has to be honest about is there's always the potential for malfeasance, for corruption. And so whoever you partner, you need to be comfortable with that they're actually going to deliver on that which they were 
charged to deliver. You know, uh, one of the things that's bedeviled us is you found opportunist finding ways in which to use funding for absolutely the wrong purposes or giving substandard services and fraud. So APSA had to have a, a vetting process and it's been quite interesting trying to put that in place. Uh, and then finally, given that we're a bank, we work with regulators. So whether it was around debt relief, debt relief programs, which, which are almost universally available in some respects, but we have to think very carefully about debt relief versus debt forgiveness and educating uh, everybody in that value chain about the difference between the two and then being able to fund that which is sustainable. You know, it's very easy to say you're going to give money to funding nurses, but if you don't have the equipment that the nurses need, etc., it's just, you know, throwing good money after back. I could go on and on. So we have to be agile. We have to find the right partners. We're still learning a huge amount about what works and what doesn't work. We've had to make sure that we're able to make sure that when we work with governments or other stakeholders, that it is also something that, you know, is publicly, you can scrutinize this and, and still come out on the other end very comfortably. So we're able to leverage off much of the work that you've done, uh, some of the other larger organizations out there have done, and we continue to learn around this part. I could go on and on, but I'll stop there and take next question, perhaps. Thank you, Peter. And um, uh, one point I absolutely take away is the need for um, agility and the fact that so many of our institutions have had to um, uh, dance much faster than we're used to. Um, certainly our board has made decisions um, in the course of the last few months in a fraction of the time that it has ever made um, decisions Absolutely. before. The other thing that comes very clearly through your comments is the need to think quite broadly about the impact um, flowing through to the economy, to debt, and so on. Young people have been in a particular position um, in the crisis. In some ways, they've been better off because on the whole, mortality has been less for the younger you are. On the other hand, they're probably one of the most vulnerable parts of society when it comes to the longer term consequences. They're out of school, they're out of college, they can't get a job. Um, uh, they, I think, have been one of the groups most affected by the psychological and mental health impact of being in lockdown, of being isolated um, from other young people. Carlos, can you share a bit of your perspective on the impact on young people and also how we get their voices heard and how we mobilize the youth to argue, to advocate for bigger and more effective responses from both governments and the private sector. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so honored to be uh, on this panel. Thank you uh, uh, to the Global Fund to put on this agenda the role of the young people. I think it's very important that, uh, especially when we talk about Africa, the majority of the populations are young people. So we cannot talk about dealing with the critical issue without involving young people. So thank you for that. And we are so honored to be a partner of the Global Fund since October 2019. And to have all of you here on this panel is a demonstration of this uh, SDG 17 about partnership, because we believe in the YMCA that not a single organization, not a single government can solve those problems. But we can, when we come together with government and private sector, we will be able to find some solution and work our talk. The YMCA is known to you, but we are present in 120 countries. Uh, we reach out to about 60 million uh, around the world, involved in 12,000 communities. We are huge, we are a huge organization, but uh, not very well known that we are engaged on more critical issues young people are affecting. So when it comes to COVID, I will say clearly, and I, I dare to say COVID is primarily a youth crisis. You may not agree because older population, older people may be more vulnerable to the viruses. And some young people, 
through the attitude are showing disrespect to the rules and they are not respecting everything. But when we look closely, as you say, Peter, young people are feeling the impact of the COVID the most. You really talk about the mental health. In a study in the UK, 90% of young people have been affected by the mental anxiety. About 90% also, UNESCO is saying that their school and the studies have been distorted. And uh, when we come to the job, one in six, every job has been lost for young people. The ILO is talking about that. And we know that's going to get worse. And one thing that we are not talking about is about this, uh, um, when it comes to digital divide, we know that the world is going digital. And many young people, among more than 3 billion people in the, in the world, don't, don't have access to uh, digital, to internet. So they are being left behind, and these are the young people. So generally, we are saying COVID might be stealing young people's future before our very eyes. And that is very important that we want to address that. How do we make the voice of young people heard? The young people are talking. The question is, are we listening? Are we listening to the young people? Because they are talking, but not all of them are Greta Thunberg or Malala or those who are very visible. There are thousands of young people in our community in the remote places. Not only they are talking, but they are taking action. We see in many communities, the front first responder are the young people to reach out to the elderly, to distribute food, to produce masks, to do all those. These are young people and they are talking, but are we really listening? While we are concerned about the effect on COVID and other diseases like uh, tuberculosis and malaria and HIV AIDS, I know many young people in Senegal and Liberia, for example, continue to distribute mosquito nets in their community. In, the, in Matare, in Kenya, or in, in the community Mizamoetu in the Cape, in South Africa, the youth friendly testing center is still there to advise uh, uh, tests to young people on HIV AIDS and also distribute the ARV. So young people are still there. And as you know, there is a big wave of this uh, uh, equity, Black Lives Matter. These have been driven by young people in the middle of the COVID. They just went and say, we don't agree. So the voice of the young people are there, but do we listen to them? That's a that's very important uh, point we need to consider. It's not just about their voice being here, but it's our ability to listen to them. How do we mobilize them? In the YMCA and also with our peer organization, we realize that this generation of young people, those we call the millennial or the generation Z or very soon the generation alpha, they lost trust in the system. We are talking about government, we are talking about public sector, young people do not trust the government. They are not trusting the public, the public sector or private sector. Generally, they are not trusting even us as an institution, the, uh, the social uh, civil society, no, because we failed them, we were not accountable to what we say we will do. So what, how do we build again distrust among the young people? We know they are driven by causes. Young people are driven by causes, so we need to articulate the cause to them. But they don't wait until we do, they are just doing themselves, they are moving. So what we need to do is to hold the space to nurture the initiative, to make sure that they have a way to deliver what we want to do. But more importantly for us, it's important to involve young people in a system change, because this is what the young people are telling us, systemic change, because the same cause produce the same effect. If you don't change the systems, we will find ourselves 20 years from now talking about the same thing. There will be more COVID, all that pandemic will come. We will never learn as, um, I will ask Monica to say, I didn't, I didn't want to call her the excellency as she said, but we are not learning. So why young people want to be involved in, 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 in this system chain. So how do we mobilize more young people to empower, we call that empowering them, provide the space, nurture their ambition, give them the tool to, to, to work and to produce those results. But it cannot happen in vacuum. 
us as organization, as work with young people, my peers like the Scout, the Red Cross, YWC, and other youth organizations, government, academia, all of them, we need to come together. We need, especially when it comes to the civil society, we need support from private sector, from government, from academia. We need strong support in terms of data. We lack those data, the financial and also expertise. Those are the things we need to put together. But I want to say very clearly that in Africa, especially because this is where I come from and I know also very well, by 2050, two out of five people will be born in Africa. And the majority of those will be beyond the, below the age of 25. And this is the time to start investing on those young people, to build their capacity, to make sure that they are prepared to take over. Not to take over just to empower like we used to do, but it's to take responsibility to make change in the community. So to conclude, I will simply say we need to empower the young people in the holistic way. But we need to also think about those organizations, those associations empowering young people. And remember, we need to listen to them. We need to hold the space and also let them go to make the change in the community. Thank you. Carlos, that was very powerful. And I, I heard a number of echoes with some of the points that uh, Monica had made about the importance of inclusive leadership and including the young in that leadership, about the importance of system level impact, as you say, and the importance of communication, which includes not just talking to people, but listening to uh, what they have to say. Turning Jennifer to you and Red, um, Peter Mejari talked about the um, resonance with the early days of the response to the HIV AIDS crisis. And obviously, RED has been one of the most extraordinary examples of how to mobilize the private sector in the fight against HIV AIDS. How, how do we leverage that uh, experience? How do we take from the fact that only a tiny fraction of the damage that has been done to the private sector would make a massive difference in the COVID response? Uh, how do we make it easier for companies to engage and, and help mount this effective response to a more effective response to the pandemic? Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think it's important to start where, where RED began. Obviously, RED was created to fund the Global Fund, right? So, so we have been charged with um, you know, harnessing the private sector. And so this is, you know, we're going on 15 years of doing this. And I think it's important to remember the model that RED started with, which was very, very simple. It was a, pro a company creates a product, uh, that product goes RED, and a piece of the portion, a, a piece of the profits from the company goes to the global fund. So again, this isn't tapping into people's pockets, it's tapping into the company's pockets, right? So if you buy a black iPhone versus a red iPhone, when you buy the red one, it looks, it, sorry, it, it functions exactly the same. But when you choose the red one, that triggers Apple, thank you, um, to give money to the global fund. So that's a very simple model. And I think that has been very successful for red. You know, we've generated over $650 million, um, certainly over $230 million from Apple alone is, is astounding. Um, but I think, you know, after 15 years, we've got to think a little bit differently. And I think we've learned a lot. And I think it's important to remember about when you go through things, you've got to try new things and you've got to learn from them and then and then move on. And so I think for RED and where we're at right now, I think we've got to um, expand the way companies can go RED. And when, when Mike Froman was, was speaking, I felt like you were singing my song there um, because I think there are, there are companies that, that don't necessarily know how to do this. And I think that's the beauty of RED. You know, my background, I worked in an ad agency. Many of us are advertisers, marketers, creative people. And I think what's really important is to help companies understand that this is a strategic 
initiative. So this isn't just about, you know, our co-founder always said, this isn't about charity. This is about justice, right? This is about helping. I mean, let's not be naive. Companies need to make money. I get it. Right. And if you want to be a red partner, it's got to be sustainable for you because if it's not sustainable for you, it's never going to be sustainable for the money going to the global fund. And so what we've worked really hard at is being strategic and getting into conversations with companies, understanding what are your business objectives and how can RED help you meet those business objectives. This isn't just about cutting a check. I, I think Mike had said that earlier. It's not just about, of course we want the money, but we've got to make it something that's interesting for your customers, for your employees, for your shareholders. And, you know, I think the beauty of RED is that we need to go in and, and, and really, you know, sort of kick the tires a little bit and say, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? Because we know how to do this. And so that's really important for us. I think it's also really important for us to expand the industries that we're going after. You know, again, Red started out, it was Gap t-shirts and, and, you know, Apple iPods and, and a number of other things. And I think what we've learned is that there's a number of companies out there who may not have a tangible product, especially now in the digital world, like whether it's apps or gaming, you know, there are things, there, there are places where, and, and Carlos, you know, talking about hearing the young people and what they're doing, I mean, those people hold not only incredible power, but an, an incredible passion for wanting to see, you know, a better world ahead. And so we've got to find the places where they are and tap into them. And so I think people think about Red and they think about, you know, the, the, the products that are in the windows on, on Main Street. But I think what's equally important for us is to go and think about where are Gen Z, Gen Y out there? Where are they spending their money? Because especially with COVID, there are a lot of companies out there that, are, that have been really hit hard by the economic downturn. So we've got to go into companies and be smart because we're fighting for every dollar. And so we've got to make sure that we're thinking about where are those industries right now? They're probably really different than the industries maybe six or eight months ago. Maybe we would have been targeting hospitality and other places. We've got to think beyond that. We also have to think about industries where, and, and I know my Peter is uh, Peter Lee is right next to me, but, but companies, and Microsoft has been a red partner in the past, companies that are doing even like um, B2B, services. So Salesforce is one of our partners. I'll be really honest, I didn't know how we were going to partner with Salesforce, but what you when you get in and you understand their business, their strategies, I think we're able to then say, okay, where is that link? And I think what's happened recently with COVID is that we've been going into these boardrooms and having conversations and talking to people about helping to fight AIDS in Africa. And I'll be honest, that's been really tricky, especially now when COVID is sitting I live on the Upper West Side and obviously in March, it was like, how can we possibly think about AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa when we don't have PPE at Mount Sinai around the corner? And so I think that what it's, what it's for RED, what we're thinking about is these are actually two pandemics. And I think, you know, uh, Peter has also spoken about this, that what, what we learned in fighting HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa is now what we can do and harness to fight glo uh, COVID globally. And so thanks to the Global Fund and the COVID-19 response, we're able to give partners that choice. And we've seen partners like Apple say, we want to redirect our funding because we understand the threat that COVID poses to all of the uh, progress we've had over the past 15 years of partnering with you. So I think at the end of the day, it's about being really strategic, being really creative and thinking about the impact of what these partnerships can do. Thanks, Jennifer. And I have to say, I think it is quite extraordinary. I don't think there's a parallel really anywhere um, in the way that RED has managed to mobilize 650 million um, for the fight against HIV AIDS. And, and I think there is a lot to learn from the way you've worked with companies um, to mobilize and excite them about what can be achieved. It's Turning not easy. I feel like I've got the battle scars for it, but, it, but, but it's never, I feel like the world has never needed red more than right now. And I think we're able to really, you know, make an impact and, and be really thoughtful 
about what's going on in the world. So I feel like there is, it's an exciting time at RED um, and we're really looking forward to how to engage the private sector in new and interesting ways. Fantastic. Turning to the third Peter on the panel, uh, Peter Lee from Microsoft. Um, Peter, Microsoft actually has a, a, a partnership with the Global Fund that has expanded in all sorts of different ways. Um, from working on TB technology tools to helping civil society with um, uh, their interaction during lockdowns through Teams to um, digital health systems. I know we've been doing stuff um, in, in Rwanda with um, MasterCard actually. Um, and uh, we would, it, but can you go to the same question, which is how do we? broaden, I mean, we're kind of preaching to the converted on this particular panel. You're all the institutions that have kind of got involved and are really kind of committed. But how do we broaden? There are so many companies out there that haven't actually engaged in the response to COVID and improving public health. Uh, Monica, right at the beginning said, you know, it's actually quite tiny, um, the um, involvement of the private sector. Um, how, how do we get that broader engagement? Because surely now we all understand that good public health is the foundation of our societies and economies. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me be a part of such an important conversation. It's been uh, incredibly inspiring to hear the ideas and the passion of all the panelists. I have been learning a lot. And I think that's been a big thing for corporations in particular. I think it's been a learning process. Uh, it, uh, I know at Microsoft, it has taken a long time. It's sort, been sort of a dawning realization of the global and long lasting nature of what's happening right now. Um, uh, speaking as a technologist, starting back in February, March, I viewed this as a summer project. You know, we would do our bit for the world and then by the end of August, you know, uh, it would all be over and we'd be moving on. And I think it's just been a process to understand that we're in the midst of some deep structural shifts in, in the world. Uh, and that this isn't just temporary volunteer effort that actually we have to change internally. And so on your question, if I think about what would be the motivators for corporations uh, one of the most fundamental things to understand, especially in technology oriented industries is we all aspire to play offense, but we end up playing defense most of the time, uh, by which I mean, we want to be the disruptors. We want to find the green fields, the new opportunities, but we actually spend most of our time defending our turf and, and you know, always being somewhat concerned about who's going to, uh, to disrupt us. And, and so the kinds of things that uh, the Global Fund in partnership uh, with you, Peter, um, the ideas that uh, you know, Jennifer and Michael uh, had mentioned are incredibly important because they end up creating defined programs that tell us uh, here is a place to go you know, where you can you know, play more of the disruptor role. Uh, where you can play, uh, be on a more offensive stance than, than a defensive stance. And that is just incredibly important because it's so hard to just jump in and go it alone and, 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 and try to, to uh, make a difference. And internally within the corporate structures, it's very difficult to, to justify those things. The other thing that's very powerful is the power of collaboration and coalitions. Um, you know, it's frankly, it's hard to say no to working coalitions. Um, and so if I think about our attachment to the Global Fund and our participation, it's not just the Global Fund, but the fact uh, that you've created coalitions uh, of corporations and, and uh, foundations and other organizations that, that we can partner with. Um, and those partnerships and alliances uh, are, are very, very strong uh, motivations. Uh, and then the constant emphasis on the global nature of this um, and really helping us understand and define the, the deep structural shifts uh, in the world. Um, those things create new thought processes that convert what are normally just 
viewed as internal crisis response efforts uh, into more permanent organizational shifts within within the company. And um, you know, already I think the work that we've been doing uh, with you has, has really led to some organizational changes within within Microsoft. Those defined programs have done the same thing. Um, uh, so those coupled with uh, the power of coalitions, I think, um, you know, have, have been really, really important. But don't assume too much from corporations. We're so focused, we tend to have blinders on and we don't realize necessarily what's going on in the wider world. And so just, just that insight is, in, is incredibly powerful on its own. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I'm conscious we're running out of time, but um, Monica, you set us off on this journey of conversation. Do you have any very brief instant reactions to some of the things you've heard from the other people on the panel? Yes, I just want to pick up on a few themes um, that kept on coming out, and that's the, the, the power of partnerships, um, the agility that um, Peter McClary was speaking about. I think the importance of Carlos, what Carlos was saying about um, young people, but also, um, and I think Michael also mentioned it, that um, the assistance doesn't just need to be financial, it can be non-financial. Um, and part of that that came out very strongly to me is, is the extraordinary brain power that's in the private sector that is very focused on um, resolving formal economy problems and not necessarily those in the informal economy and, and, and broadening that. Um, I think there's exceptional people in the public health systems. I think there's exceptional people in the public sectors. But I do think that the private sector can mobilize its brain trust to um, assist with some of the operational logistical issues that the public um, sector does find itself in. Um, and that also goes along with an obligation, Carlos, that young people also get um, encouraged um, to apply their trade, um, their skills and their innovation within the public sector, because uh, I'm on a personal mission to try and convince young people to work more in governments, more in the public health systems. And it's a, it's a difficult ask. I understand the frustration that they face, but we're not going to fix the public system um, without applying our best brains to our most complex problems. So I, I agree with uh, everything that has been said. Thanks, Monica. I'm conscious there's one question we had in from the audience, which is about um, how have previous investments in responding to HIV, TB, and malaria contributed to a more robust and effective global COVID-19 response? I suppose that's really a question for me. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, the it's it's contributed in so many different ways. Um, I think if you look at the way testing is being done in many uh, countries, uh, it's actually off the back of the investments that have been made in TB diagnosis or HIV viral load testing, because it's those PCR machines and instruments and the laboratories that have been used. Um, if you look at the way um, COVID um, tracking and tracing is being done in many communities, it's the community health workers that organizations like the Global Fund or PEPFAR help support um, uh, that are actually conducting that. And more generally, I think actually one of the advantages that Africa has had in responding to COVID has been the strength of community health systems um, that have been developed, particularly in response to um, HIV, TB and malaria, and who have mobilized very effectively um, in response to COVID. But I'd also say that actually the kinds of partnership um, that we've been talking about, the experience of RED, um, the partnerships we've had with other um, uh, companies like Microsoft or MasterCard, um, there's an enormous amount we can leverage um, um, from what we've learned because it's actually taken time to build these partnerships. It's quite hard to build partnerships between public sector organizations and the private sector. Um, and the fact that we've learned how to work with each other through the experience of fighting other diseases, I think stands us in good stead um, to fighting uh, COVID. I am conscious that we have now um, run out of time. I sort of feel like we were just getting going on what seemed like um, a very uh, interesting and stimulating um, discussion. I, I would like to thank um, all 
um, the panelists on this um, call for your um, insights and perspectives. Um, I think it's actually this kind of sharing of ideas and sharing of perspectives that is the starting point for the kind of collaboration and partnership that, as Monica said, is essential um, to responding to the pandemic and its knock-on impact. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.